doing a two-camera experiment, so I got the phone pointed at the screen. So I was going to zoom this in because this one does a better job at seeing the person. Like, Sweet. The light changes, so. well, I could always walk up to the camera too. You could. <laughs> Do you see me now? Do you see me now? All right, exactly. <laughs> All right. There we go. Okay. Play. Okay, well, um, everybody's probably ready to go get beer here soon, and I'm actually not going to talk insanely long with this one. This presentation has actually been, I decided to do this uh, about uh, just, what, maybe five days ago or whatever, and I threw the slides together last night. So this may or may not be one of my best presentations, but we'll see. Um, in fact, actually, in fact, during the last presentation, I decided to rename it. And so we're no longer called just DB Charmer. We are called Developer Happiness. Oh, wait a minute. We don't have screen stuff. Screen failure. What is going on here? There you go. That's good. That, oh, I know what the problem is. I am not in mirroring mode. That is exactly what the problem is. So is this one person that carries the presentation without the visual aid? There we go. Using T mugs instead of screens. Yo! Oh, ouch. <laughs> okay, so stealing thunder a little bit, we have renamed the presentation now. And this presentation is now called Developer Happiness <laughs> with SQL. Oh, is this a cage B of the yeah. Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> and DB Charm. Oh. <laughs> okay. So, introductions, um, you know. My name's Lance Gleason, of course. Um, how many people here, just out of curiosity, have seen me speak before? Okay, so we have a few new faces, which is cool. But all right. Um, I have a small little company. It's called Polyglot Programming. There's actually two of us. We do everything. Primarily, we do Ruby development, but we also do a bit of actually analytics. Um, I've actually got another person on staff who has quite a bit of deep knowledge with data science and things like that. Um, we're always looking for great projects. And we have availability coming up in mid-August. So if anybody's looking for some good contract stuff, efficient stuff, efficient work, you know, great work and all that, do contact us. Um, but at any rate, one question I have for people, especially the people that have not seen me talk before, how many of you have tried pair programming? Wow, actually a few. Okay. Well, you know, a couple of years ago I actually went independent, worked a lot more at home. And kind of had a problem because when you're consulting quite a bit, your hired gun or something like that, it's like when you're working for a big company, you have plenty of resources to get dev pairs and things like that. But what do you do when you don't have a dev pair, especially when you're at home? Anybody ever thought of that, tried to figure out how to solve that problem? Right. Well, you could do that. Well, one day I was sitting around thinking about this, and I saw this. How many people here have cats? <laughs> And I thought, you know, my cat's really smart. In fact, she is, I think, at times smarter than some developers I've worked with, but that's either here or there. <laughs> but she is, she's really smart. I mean, I can remember since she was a kitten, she'd lay in my laptop bag or she'd lay on top of the laptop. And I always thought when she was jumping on my lap and I was, I was programming that she just wanted attention. But then I thought, you know, I think she's trying to tell me something. And so what if we take extreme programming to the next level? And so here we are getting ready with an experiment here. We call it per programming. Now, as you can see here, we're trying to follow all the good practices you normally would. So we both have comfortable chairs here. Allie's kind of set up right there. Um, we decided to use the shared keyboard setup here. And you know, the surprising thing is I thought that she would primarily be the observer, but she drives too. So if you get a chance sometime, you should definitely should try it. Per well, and so one other thing with it, for those people that have dogs, we, we tried some experiments with girl programming or something else like that. It hasn't worked so well you know, thus far. I mean, because let's face it, we have these two Shizus here, but the cat rules the roost. I mean, this, pretty, this picture demonstrates the hierarchy in our house. So um, we've, I've blogged about it a bit. There's a little website with it. And we've actually also, this is kind of still in development phases, but we actually have perprogramming.com. You should try it. Check it out. It's a lot of fun. OK, so 
we're obviously talking about databases. This is like Database Wednesday here. To kind of get into this, though, how many people are actively deploying on Heroku right now? And out of those people, are those your, is that your primary deployment mechanism? Are you primarily using Heroku? OK, so a couple. Some of the scaling discussion will probably be premature for you. Um, how many people are, obviously then everybody else is using kind of other platforms. Um, how many people here have run into scenarios where their database is starting to fall over? All right, so a couple. It's kind of interesting, because I think it depends on the community you're in a little bit with this, too. Um, I was actually in Nashville a month and a half ago. I went to one of their meetups. and. It was interesting where I just asked the question even, um, I was just starting to use DB Charmer, and I, I asked um, if anybody else had it, and they kind of looked, it was like almost everybody was on Heroku. They're like, no, our apps are small. So it's kind of interesting where you run, run into with that. Um, but at any rate, so let's talk about scaling a little bit. So what is scaling? Well, it's not dealing with scales. It's not fish scales, and it's not going to the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that reaction. Uh, <laughs> it's about supporting more users. That's what we're talking about, of course. So, and in our case, obviously, we're talking about SQL. So <clears throat> you have a SQL database, and it's starting, the performance is starting to get bad. So what do you do? Well, one approach usually, quite often, when it starts to get bad, is you can add indexes. That's what a lot of people do. You're starting to try to optimize the database as it sits today. Um, then you might start to optimize your queries. You might find out that Active Record is, for example, making three gazillion different individual calls on an N plus one query, and you're better off to just write it by hand, SQL, or something else like that. And then finally, you've done all that, and you just say, ah, the hell with it. Let's just throw more hardware at it. How many people have ever, so actually, it looks like not that many people have had to do scaling, but how many people have run across this before? OK, so a few. Yeah, so you know what the pain is. You know about all the fun stuff where, and these are good problems to have, but obviously. Well, that's true. That is actually very true. And if that's the case, then you know I would not rec you know in fact I would not go to some of the next the techniques that we're going to talk about. But yes, so you've run across the limits with that one. What's one strategy that you could use to basically get some performance back? And so replication comes up quite often as one approach. Now I remember when I first heard about this when I was uh, doing one of my first skill outs, I was like, how the hell is replication going to help my database? Because Usually, you're going to have like a master-slave type of scenario with it. So what's that going to help me with? I still am only going to hit one database, probably. Well, the, the common scenario, and it, these are, this is not the only scenario you'd use, is to have something like this. Or basically, this would be a website that it could be up to something like maybe a 50-50, where 50% 50 of the usage is writes, 50% of the usage is happens to be uh, reads. Now, with this particular one, I would say this is probably more of a 2075 type of thing. But the idea is, is what you would do with a replication to increase the performance of your website, you'd say, OK, we're going to make sure that all the rights for our application go over to this master. The master is going to replicate the data over to these slaves. And for all of the requests that do your reads, they're going to come off of here. The idea being you're taking load off the servers, but yet you're keeping things consistent, and that can help you quite a bit with it. The problem with that is, and in fact, I ran into this recently with one client, was that their application was very, very write intensive. And in particular, the queries that were giving them the most problems were very write intensive, because they had this huge table. And I mean, we're talking literally, it's, it was getting up to like a billion rows. So then we get over to sharding. What is sharding? Well, in essence, instead of having just replicating the database, what we do is we say, we're going to split the database up. So you might still have an app server here. You're going to have something that's going to act as like your locator. Ah. There we go. Sorry about that. <laughs> My remote. Um, so you're going to have something here that's going to act like your main, your, your locator, your sort of master database, your master to tell you where things are. 
And then based on some sort of a mechanism, be it a kind of an index or a hash or some other scheme, you're going to use you're going to use this to basically say, for certain pieces of data, go to this shard, for certain pieces, go to this shard, and for other pieces, go here. But then in Rubyland, and this is what I ran into, which is kind of how what's led to me talking about this today, how do you support this with Active Record? I need to have multiple databases, but I need to be able to somehow connect to them within the same application. Now, I don't know if anybody else has had experience with this one, but I kind of did a bit of research. And there are some other tools out there, but the one that kind of seemed to be the best one that, for the job seemed to be DB Charmer. That's kind of a cool little graphic, by the way, too. A little, it should be a database, but whatever. So what do you do DB Charmer then? How, what does it take to basically set up and use this thing? Well, in essence, you just gem include it your gem set. And you're going to modify. This is a snippet from a database.yaml file. And if you notice what looks a little bit different, normally these things right here would be at the same level as this guy right here. Whoa. All right, I'm taking this remote back. <laughs> All right, so these guys right here would be at the same level as these guys right here. But instead, what you're doing is you're moving these down. And so blah would happen to be one database that you're accessing. Foo would be another, but they both would be under your production environment here. Now, one thing that I don't have in this example, because to be quite frank, there wasn't enough room, was usually when I've used, for the instances that I've used with DB Charmer thus far, I usually will also put what they call a default set, where I will actually have something that looks like this above here referencing another database, which is my default connection. It could be the same as block, but in our case, we used it as a different database. Then you have these two guys. And then in essence, all you have to do to switch your connection is just, here's an example model, very simple. Say foo for that model, switch the connection to blah, foo, the connection that bar is using, Baz's connection, or nil, which would take you to default. Once you do this, within a thread of execution, what happens in essence is that after this line now, if, I've, if I had some other code right in between, like right in here, all the, all connect, basically all queries that are going through foo, be it either through at the object level or the instance level, are going to go through that connection until such time as I change it to something else. So, I mean, it's really pretty easy. Now, you could, we could stop at just that, but there are a few problems with that. Migrations. If you were to take, even with DB Charmer installed, and use this file right here, this basically would not perform, this file as is would not give you any migrations, and if you had the default, it would only, provide, it would only perform the migration on whatever was at this level up there. But DB Charmer luckily does have a mechanism to make this easier for you. So by using this little DB magic thing here, you can basically say, OK, connection, set your connection for this migration. And then everything here is just going to run on that database that you specified. If, uh, if you want to have finer grain control, it gives you that as well, where basically you can say, within the migration itself on this data, on database second DB, run these things. But then you could also add another one to say on DB first database or something else like that, do another one within the same migration. And you can also just say, well, just for all connections, I want to run the migration on everything. So there's a bit of flexibility. Do you want to only have certain tables in certain databases and other ones in the other? Do you want to just put, have everything look the same across all your databases? It's up to you. Replication. So one of the easiest ways to do it is that you could, for example, here's an example of just doing an auto switch. Basically say, run all your connections into slaves. Basically, in your model definition, 
If you just say DB magic, tell it, send this slave over, and you would have an item in your database.yaml that's called slave01. You say that, and now basically all queries are going to go to that slave. If you want to specify multiple slaves, you would just basically run it like this, and DB Charmer is automatically just going to round robin those requests, slave one, slave two, slave three, as they come in. Let's say, though, that you've got an object that you're also going to be doing, you want to do writes on as well with that <clears throat> model. Well, basically, you, you would just specify here, there's your base connection, which would be bar. So that's your main database. And then you would just say your, put your slave there. And obviously, you could also just do a default connection if you wanted to. So per query connection management, though, let's say you want a little bit finer control over. Just like our example before. You just go right back to that. And our initial example is what gives you that per query, where you can control it just in the program and not do some sort of a universal type of a schema with that. You can also decide to basic, you can also basically put that into a block and run those in the block. You can also basically specify <clears throat> within, within just a, as a per statement thing, I want to take and just run this one statement on a certain connection. And you can, you'll see here that we have basically on these ones, we're saying, OK, run this on the master, get the last, right? do some find buys and things like that. You can also, though, and I'm kind of mixing examples a little bit here, but basically what you're seeing is on one, you're saying, OK, on master, do a find by. You could just as easily call that on slave if you wanted to. And then here, you can even say, well, OK, for just this, co this command here, run this command on this, on this database, specify it, and then run whatever you want to do a find, do a count, whatever you want to do. All right. So it's actually it's insanely easy, not a lot to it. Sharding. Out of the box, DB Charmer does give you some sharding mechanisms you can use if you so desire. It has a range configuration you can use. It has a hash map. It has this thing called DB block map, and it has this thing called DB group map. And I'm not going to go into the details of it. And it also even has this mechanism you can use to create these custom sharding methods with like all this logic and all different things like that. For my project, this is what that felt like. <laughs> DB Charmer makes a lot of things easy, but I, I kind of looked at that and I said it just it felt like overkill and I didn't want to be that reliant on it. So at least for our project, what we did is we just said, ah, eh, let's just use our own mechanism. We had one big table. We could easily just add a column to another table to basically um, allow us to reference which one we wanted to use. And then when we assigned a new record, we could round robin it, the assignments, but we could also keep the old ones. And for us, that worked. So is it thread safe? Sort of. They kind of support it. They kind of don't. Um, I would recommend probably for production for a production app, which is what I've run it in. Um, I would keep it on MRI. It's actually I've had one in, I've had an instance on production since I think it's been like about three weeks now, and no, no problems. problems. It, was it was actually surprisingly smooth. Testing. Testing. So this is a gotcha. How many people here, so we obviously just talked about like Mongo, DB, and different things like that. How many people here have worked within Rails using something like Mongoid, for example? That's the best example because I happen to know it. Okay. You probably then are familiar with the fact that unlike active record, you don't have the concept of a transaction. And because you don't have the concept of a trans transaction, you don't have rollbacks. DB Charmer will break your transaction if you change your database connection in a test. And so what that means is you have to go, you have to use the same mechanisms you might use when using a NoSQL database where you have to clean up after yourself. But the big question, before you use DB Charmer, 
and even maybe before you get too deep into optimizing your SQL databases, are you covering up a smell? <coughs> and I'm not going to get into the whole thing except to say that yes, there are, all, are alternatives. And would your data be better represented in a NoSQL database? And I'm trolling here a little bit. And so, of course, you could look at Cassandra, you could look at React, CouchDB, and of course, Mongo. And that's it. Any questions? Yeah. So you, you said at the very beginning, and you kind of just like rushed by it, that when you switch connections, that affects queries both on the class and the instance level, or the object level. Yes. So does that mean if you query out a model, then you switch instances like on the class or something, mm -hmm. and then you call save on that instance of a model, does it go to the wrong database? OK. It depends on how you use it. So we go back here a little bit. All right. The switch connection to, where is that? There we go, right there. If you're using this mechanism here, then you are switching that connection for the life of the thread that you're executing. Sure. Be it object level or be it instance level. So, so if you say, you know, you, you query out a foo. Yeah. And then you say switch to DB bar, then you query out a bar. Yes. And then you save your foo, it goes to the wrong place. Correct. Assuming you didn't actually mean to put it in the new place. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yep. Is there not a better way to only send the writes to the master and then just in, send the reads at you know the active record level? I mean, switching connections just to do different things seems weird. Well, that's where if you're doing that type of a thing, we're using master slave. Mm -hmm. That's where if you look at these examples here, you're basically you're setting. Yeah, what is this nice line back here? Okay. Yeah, here you go, right here. If you've done a configuration like this, it's automatically going to send all the, the writes to your master, which would be this guy right here. And all the reads are automatically going to go to the slave. But that makes sense. I yeah. don't know why I missed that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is there any way to. To, I, I, I might have missed this, but is there a way to only do um, only split up your databases in production, and then in development and test, it's just one database, and it kind of magically only goes to that database? Uh, there's nothing that stops you from doing that, depending on how you've designed the application. Okay. I mean, providing that you don't have some crazy logic that's splitting that up, but even with that, I mean, I know in the app that we had, we actually were able to run most of our tests just using one database. But then what we ended up, where we, run in, where we actually ran into the test problem was that we wanted to also have some tests around our code that was actually doing the switching and the shards. So at that point, I mean, we had to go, we had to have at least a few tests that cleaned up after themselves that did it. But then what we did is we had everything else to just default to the one connection, which then didn't break the rollback. So everything else would just roll back automatically. But then when we were testing the sharding and, you know, changing it, doing that thing. Okay. But when you have this, like, on or I guess when you're like uh, switching the connection or whatever, that you have to like abstract that code out for your testing, or does it just keep the same test database? Well, all right, no, when you're switching the connection out, for that part, you're gonna wanna clean up after yourself. So in other words, you, what we did is we actually, it's just one configuration that we used, but what we did is we just, when you weren't switching connections, it would just, or if you were switching a connection to like a null, which would go to the default, then it would actually keep everything in the transaction. But when we had code that was actually changing to another one of the connections, then we just clean up after ourselves. But we just kept it all in the same thing versus trying to abstract it out where you have one configuration for testing the sharding and the other one not. So then we could just run it in one contiguous test suite. Does that make sense or is that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, when you were looking for solutions for this problem? Like, did you run to, or did you look at Octopus? And like, why did you uh, choose to each armor? Um, I looked at Octopus, and it looked like there wasn't as much support. And I kind of, I like this, I like the syntax of DB Charmer a little bit better, too. And it seemed like that was kind of the more favored, supported solution, shall we say? Not to say Octopus is not good, but yeah. Well, yeah. It was just like we, uh, we were trying to, do some of this sharding stuff and like 
got Heroku to help us with it, and like they, they didn't even mention DB Charmer, so we didn't really get a chance to look at it before. Interesting. As a solution. Now, how long ago did you look at that too? Okay, okay, interesting. It might be because it's only MySQL, I think, and Postgres is, um, I mean, Heroku is Postgres. Yeah. Yep. I think DB Charmer is only MySQL. I'm not, I don't think so. I could be wrong on that one. I thought it had multiple database support. I mean, we did it for a MySQL, and I'll be the first to say I'm not. I have about a month and a half of experience with DB Charmer, so. <laughs> and I'm just sharing it because I've seen that a lot of people have never even touched it and seen it, so it's to get the discussion going and that kind of thing. But, um, sorry, I saw a question back there. I was related. To, I, I looked at the DB Charmer like a year ago, and I was curious to see if it still only supported MySQL. Okay. That's probably why Perlman didn't bring it up. If it yeah, reading the readme, it's still missing. Is it? Okay, yeah. Oh, gosh. Alrighty, any other questions? Okie doke.